Okay, good afternoon everybody, and I'm going to record this lecture of uh, ventricular diseases and cardiomyopathy that I gave uh, to all of you, I think, yesterday. So now I'm going to record it, and you can have it. So ventricular disease, mainly for the myopathy. This lecture is based on two guidelines. The first guideline is old, is 2011 guideline by American Society of Echo and uh, by American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and MRI. And that's a recommendation for multimodality cardiovascular imaging of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the second guideline, that is a recent guideline, was published in 2020. That's a guideline of American Society of ECHO and American and Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists and Society of Thoracic Surgeons. So the cardiac surgeons are inside this guideline as well. And uh, they talk about decision making in the OR for different uh, uh, surgical procedure between uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, uh, echocardiographer, that is anesthesiologist again, or maybe cardiologist, and cardiac surgeon. And this is a guideline that I recommend all of you to read it very well, for example. So, cardiomyopathy. We have three types of cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is an asymmetric hypertrophy on one part of the heart, most of them septum, but it can be apex or mid cavity as well. Usually, their systolic function is normal at the beginning, except they come very late. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a cardiomyopathy that, again, has mainly diastolic dysfunction, maybe systolic function is normal at the beginning, but they don't have any asymmetric hypertrophy. They might have hypertrophy, but it is symmetric. And dilated cardiomyopathy, as you see, the LV is more dilated, and systolic function is uh, depressed, and maybe at the end, diastolic dysfunction. So this is two types of classification of cardiomyopathy, one by WHO and one by American Heart Association. WHO classification defined the cardiomyopathy as a disease of the myocardium associated with cardiac dysfunction. And they classified the cardiomyopathy as a dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, aerifusionic. This is a RV cardiomyopathy mainly, we call it RV dysplasia. They don't have usually surgical treatment. They don't come to the OR. And some unclassified cardiomyopathy that, again, most of them, they don't come to OR except for LVAD or for transplant. Uh, American Heart Association expert panel definition for cardiomyopathy, again, define the cardiomyopathy as a disease that is mainly in the myocardium. It can be because of the heart itself, or it can be because of the systemic disease. And based on American Heart Association, cardiomyopathy can be primary or secondary. Primary, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is a part of the primary cardiomyopathy. And uh, it can be mixed as well. It can be acquired as well, like inflammatory myocarditis. That's one of the main causes of cardiomyopathy that usually goes to dilated cardiomyopathy, like a COVID can give a myocarditis, or even Chagas is a type of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy because of the, again, involvement of the myocardium. A stress-induced, that's a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So all of them are primary. Secondary, it means there is another disease and created the cardiomyopathy, like a amyloidosis like a storage disease, like a toxicity, like a hyper syndrome, inflammation like sarcoidosis, 
an endocrine disease and some other type of disease. <clears throat> what about management of the patient with hypertroph hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Uh, that is the one that we will see them in the OR and we as an echocardiographer, we have to know how to diagnose them and how to manage them. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is characterized by left ventricular outflow tract obstruction <clears throat> due to asymmetric septal hypertrophy and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Patients who fail medical management and have ongoing symptoms of dyspnea, chest pain, or syncope can be managed either by myectomy surgical or alcohol ablation. That alcohol ablation is mainly European procedure, and we don't do too many here, but I came from Europe to North America. So North America treatment is mainly surgical treatment. In addition, some centers offer concomitant mitral valve surgery for primary treatment of LVT obstruction, especially for cases with no significant septal hypertrophy. They might have just mitral valve replacement and or mitral clip to treat the MR. <coughs> Surgical resection of muscle from the subaortic region to enlarge the LVUT results in relief of SAM of the mitral valve and its resultant mitral regurgitation. Surgical myectomy is the gold standard for refractory LVUT obstruction at centers with dedicated hypertroph obstructive cardiomyopathy surgeon so we should have a dedicated surgeon for myectomy many center we don't have a dedicated surgeon for myectomy all cardiac surgeon they do myectomy and most of the time is inadequate myectomy in dedicated hypertroph obstructive cardiomyopathy center mortality is typically less than one percent for isolated myectomy and in our center, even is less than 1%, is, is like 0.5%, is associated with excellent long-term survival. <coughs> Surgical myectomy of the septum is called Moro operation, because the first time in 1961, I think, was done by Andrew Moro. He was the chief of the surgery of... Uh, uh, NIH. He did the first myectomy, and later, uh, one of the day, he was sitting with Eugene Bromwald, our famous cardiologist, that is a textbook of cardiology, and he asked Bromwald, can you listen to my heart, because I have some palpitation. And Bromwald listened to his heart and said, oh, you have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy yourself, so you have to go for surgical treatment. And he refused that, and he had a sudden death and died. So this is a paper that was written about uh, Moreau and his uh, fate in the disease by Barry Maran. Barry Maran is from Mayo Clinic. He and his son are the two main person uh, specialized in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiologists in the world. Most of the things that we know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is written by uh, Barry Maran and his friend, Dr. Weigel, that was our cardiologist here. Dr. Weigel passed away about four or five years ago. <clears throat> this is the autopsy heart of the uh, Moro himself. And this is from <clears throat> his daughter. His daughter had a hypertrophy and passed away as well. It was a genetic disease. This is a very nice paper from Dr. Tony Rolf Edward from our center. It was published in Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2017 about the result of isolated septal myectomy in Toronto General Hospital. So in his paper, this paper, he presented 291 patients done from 2012 to 2016. So he's doing about 80 cases per year. Uh, in 150 of them, they had only isolated myectomy, no mitral valve or other things. In that 150, uh, none of his patients had a SAM significant in post-op echo. 5% they had a 
MR, great and mild. No VSD, very good result. 5% complete AV block. And only one death. One death in 150 patients. <clears throat> and Tony wrote a very nice paper again in Annals of Cardiac Surgery in terms of the technique how we do the myectomy. And this is some of the image from that. So he opened the pericardium, aortotomy, <coughs> and that's the way that he is doing every day. You can watch it in the war as well. So he start from below the right corner cusp. This is right corner cusp. This is non corner cusp, and this is left corner cusp. Surgeon is standing here. So he start from below the right corner cusp and goes towards the left main corner artery. And the depth of this myectomy is about one centimeter. So we tell him is it. 2 cm or 2.2 cm. He has an 11 blade. This is an 11 blade that will cut only 11 mm. So he will do like a 10 11 mm depth and he goes down the, the length that we told him pre op echo. We say, for example, is 4 cm from the right corner cusp, it still is second. He will go 4 cm. Usually he will go beyond the SAM septal contact. And then he will do more. And he take all of this muscle. And at the end, he will do a little bit below the right corner as well. And when the muscle came aim out, he should be able to see the papillary muscle. So the good myectomy is the myectomy that the one the surgeon look at it from aortotomy inside the LV can see the papillary muscle. This is a cut, very up, and this is a post up. Muscle is out, and we gave them the same map on load, almost by echo. And closing the orthotomy. And he has a very nice movie there as well. So I recommend you, if you go to the site of uh, UHN library and find that paper. Uh, you can see the, the movie as well. I couldn't copy the movie and bring it for you in the PowerPoint presentation. But it's a couple of minutes, I think nine minutes movie. It's a very nice movie. And Tony himself is talking. And if you see that movie, you can understand exactly what he is doing in the war. And he concluded that myectomy is the gold standard for treatment of LVT obstruction. Excellent result can be obtained at centers with dedicated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy program like our center. Careful attention throughout the procedure, preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative setting can ensure low complication and low mortality and very good long term result. <clears throat> This is one of uh, our old paper. I am part of that. Before 2000, in that time, Tony was still resident. And Dr. Bill William, head of the cardiac surgery of Sick Children Hospital, he was doing the myectomy. And I did the interrupt for him about 300 cases in eight years that I was here. Bill William actually was the resident of Mustard, the famous Mustard operation. So Bill William retired four or five years ago, and in that time he was training Tony, and now Tony is doing. So we showed that there's a good relation between relief of the MR and the myectomy. So in our video was 300, but we put 104 patients in this paper, published in Jack 2000, and we showed in 93 patients that they had. Uh, MR secondary to SAM, they improved. Another 10 patients, they had primary mitral valve disease as well. And that was our conclusion in that time. So what is our role in terms of the echo? First of all, we have three types of myectomy based on the guideline. 
The first myectomy is the way of myectomy that Moro did it. That was very limited myectomy. The second type of myectomy is called extended myectomy. That's the way that Tony is doing in our OR. Okay. The third one that is in the guideline, it says myectomy plus perication of the anterior mitral leaflet and plus release of the papillary muscle. So this came in the guideline, guideline of 2020. Uh, I asked uh, the Tony this morning actually in the OR, do you agree with everything is written in the guideline? He said, no, he doesn't agree. And he even doesn't know that center. Uh, that center is a small center in um, New York. It's called St. Luke uh, Roosevelt Hospital. It's a hospital belonging to Columbia University. It's not the main hospital in Columbia University. They are doing like a 10 case per year. So we are doing 80 per year. So everything that they said came to the guideline. We don't know. Maybe the surgeon that is in is operative here, he was sitting as a surgeon in the guideline. But anyway, I think you have to read this uh, paper and learn a little bit because the question will come from the guideline. So in that guideline, they said any time anterior mitral lift is more than 3 centimeters, MR is more than 2 plus, is a systolic anterior motion, and there is no rheumatic disease, you have to do leaflet pelication. But we are not doing at all. I asked Tony this morning, and he said he did only one leaflet pelication in the last 10 years. So he's not doing that way. So the way that the Tony did do, do the surgery is a very effective. We see it. And Mayo Clinic, they do this way as well. But the way that the guideline is discussed, is mainly in that hospital in New York. So in that guideline, they showed that uh, about 62% of all of their patients, they had a pelication of the anterior mitral leaflet. And some of them, they had a mitral valve replacement. And again, they suggested RPR repair. R means resection of the septum. P means pelication of the anterior mitral leaflet. R means release of the anterior papillary muscle. And as I said, none of these are done by Tony yet. Tony will do only the first one. A good resection. This is the some image that how we do uh, the septal resection how we do the papillary muscle release and pelication of the valve. So in periop assessment by echo, we have to see the septum very well, and we have to assess the mitral valve and the timing of the MR, and we see exactly what is the uh, cause for LVT obstruction. For the septum, we have to measure the septal thickness, uh, in the guideline, it says you can measure in four chamber view, but usually in our center, we use a long axis view, 120, to measure the septal thickness. But septal thickness in that view is a little bit oblique. So always it's better to look at the transtastic echo of the patient. All of them, they have a transtastic echo in our center uh, for myectomy. So you, you should... The best measurement is the measurement of the sickness by transtrusic. And you can use multiplanar 3D as well for better measurement. This is one of the examples of the LVUT obstruction and the MR after the SAM. Uh, this is the guideline way. Guideline said measure the septal sickness in the four chamber view. We measured in long axis view. And guideline said measure the length of the anterior mitral leaflet. If it's more than 30 millimeter or 30 centimeter, we should do pelication and we don't do it. Uh, but, but you learn everything that is written in the guideline because if there is a question, question will come based on the guideline. So the pre-op measurement and that's a post-op septum. Uh, in terms of the mitral valve, always you should see that MR is all secondary to SAM, or some MR before SAM will come. 
if the MR starts before SAM, that is primary mitoma of disease, always look at the ruptured corda, always look at the MAC especially. So about 10% of all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their MR maybe is a primary mitoma of disease plus post SAM MR. And sometimes this primary MR is obscured by the post SAM MR. And it will show up post op. And we had the case like two, three weeks ago. We didn't see any independent MR peri op. And post op, when he did the resection, the MR showed up. So, in that time, surgeon, especially Dr. Tony, because he's not very familiar with uh, mitral valve repair. So, if Tyrone is not around, he preferred not to do that case in that day if mitral valve needs repair. So, it's better, uh, mainly our echo lab, they should tell him. A useful measurement for mitral valve include the length of the leaflet as we talked it. LV2 obstruction, we should measure the gradient, see exactly what is the obstruction, is dynamic or not. Maybe there's some fixed obstruction as well, congenital. The classic uh, obstruction is a dagger shaped Doppler, and you have to differentiate it from MR. This is the obstruction of the LV3, it's a dagger shape, and this is just MR, so don't mix this one. This is a late systolic gradient. This MR jet is Doppler from R wave, from the beginning. It's a parabolic shape, and this is a dagger shape. And usually the MR velocity is higher than this. This is maybe maximum 4 meter or 5 meter. MR velocity usually is 6, 7, or 8 meter even. So this is the table in the guideline. I will not repeat it again because I said most of this. What you should do in the pre-op, what view you should use it, and what image modality, and what is your limitation. And especially our fellow, they see it, we do it every day in the OR. But you have to review all of these tables and question will come inside this table. Uh, post-op, like every post-op, you should see the adequacy of the surgical procedure and you should detect the complication. For cardio, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I will tell you, most of these cases, almost 99% of these cases, they had a good echo pre-op in our echo lab because we have a dedicated a, card, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic in our echo lab and in our cardiology is one day per week. I think one day Dr. Rakowski will sit, my teacher, and one day uh, Anna Wu will sit. So they have a good assessment, so don't worry about the pre-op assessment. Look the post-op, this is our role in the OR. First of all, we have to see that the surgical resection was adequate took enough and to see the gradient the guideline will recommend that we should challenge the LV by the vitamin 10 micro per kilo per minute increase the heart rate at least 20 and see if the velocity goes above 3 meter per second you have to ask the surgeon go back on pump and fix it we don't do it in our OR but you learn this because it might come in the exam so post op for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guideline we said we should do a, a dubitamine challenge with 10 micro per kilo per minute. Some center, they do a, a PVC. So you can ask the surgeon, just tap the heart, create the PVC to see gradient will go up or not. We used to do a PVC, and now these days we don't do it. And we don't do this dubitamine challenge. Uh, we measure the septal sickness, how much is left, and we re-evaluate the mitral valve post -op. This is like a pre-op uh, turbulence at the LVUT and the MR, and MR disappeared post-op. Uh, complication. A couple of complications. One is inadequate resection. That very rarely happens in the Tony's hand. Always resection is enough. And second complication is VST. That you will see a flow from LV to RV. Uh, so you should not make a mistake of uh, septal perforator flow as a VST. 
because VST flow is systolic and septal perforator is mainly diastolic. VST flow is very high velocity. Septal perforator flow is low velocity, it's below one meter. VST flow usually is three meter, four meter. And sometimes the patient might develop AI as well. Don't take it as a VST. So in terms of complication, as we suggested before, VST is one of the important complication. Uh, as we showed, it didn't happen in our studies, but uh, in some centers, they might have one person, two person VST. Always you have to distinguish the VST from the coronary flow or septal perforator flow that surgeon will cut it and some new AI. So VST is systolic flow, the velocity is high, usually more than two centimeters per second. Coronary flow is diastolic flow and velocity is low, is less than one meter. So that's a way to differentiate these two together. Uh, this is all table from the guideline that what we should check during the uh, post-procedure assessment and I'm not going to repeat it again I already talked about that and in terms of the mitral valve again you have to be careful that the mitral valve has the integrity is not caught there is any residual MR or not differentiated from new anterior MR. Sometimes MR, there is a new anterior MR that will not show pre-op and you might see it only in post-op. So, surgeon might tell you, oh, you didn't tell me pre-op, but sometimes it's covered by the SAM MR and will show up only in posterior, in post uh, myectomy. So, surgeon has to be ready if something is necessary for my travel, go back again. And sometimes you might have a iatrogenic MS as well. This experience of Mayo Clinic, they have the largest experience in the world. They published the result of 3,000 myectomy in a matter of like 17 years. So they do like, a, like 150 cases per year. Uh, we do like 80 cases per year. So Probably we are second center in the North America after Mayo Clinic. Uh, in their uh, myectomy 3000, uh, again, 5-6% of them, they had a mitral valve repair or replacement. And 115 of them, they had a myectomy from apical approach. This uh, senior surgeon at Mayo, Dr. Schaff, uh, he, is the pres he is the head of the cardiac surgery there. He will do the uh, apical approach as well. Uh, here, Tony is not doing. I remember when I was fellow here, Dr. David did one too from apical approach myectomy. Some of the case examples, these are all cases of our center, were done last year. Uh, I wanted to show you some of our new cases done this year and recent months uh, for this Thursday, but uh, now Victor uh, uh, Dallas Duncan, I think he was showing, hopefully he showed you some of this. Uh, this is one of the case that we did last year. You see the SAM very well, and you see the septal sickness, how we measure it. You see the systolic notch in the aortic M mode. That was the only way to diagnose the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when I was resident. In that time, 2D was not there. So that is a turbulence at the LVT and the MR. So there is early systolic MR just after QRS. This will stay after myectomy. But the MR secondary to SAM is late systole, mid systole to late systole, that will go away. This is a gradient. For we'll stop, this is site of the myectomy. Very nice extended myectomy. Very mild SAM, that's not a problem. And you see there's no turbulence at the LVT, that's a septal perforator. Septal perforator flow is a diastolic flow. 
If you see the septal perforatory is good, it means the surgeon did a good myectomy. If you don't see any septal perforator, probably surgeon didn't do any good myectomy. Maybe it's very uh, superficial. Uh, so here you see there's no turbulence at the LVT, and the mean PK is only seven or eight. Case number two is a known case of again of hypertroph. You see very like a myxomatous mitral valve. This is a valve that maybe pelication is good, but again, this one, Tony did it, video pelication of the valve, did only good myectomy, and the result was very good. So you see the SAM and the measurement. That's the MR after the SAM. After the SAM. Is it early MR that will stay? Is it late MR it will go after myectomy? Very good LV function, hypertrophy. That's a gradient pre op. In the post stop, you see the SAM is not there anymore. There's no LVT obstruction, no MR. So result is very good. The gradient The case number three is a little bit uh, challenging because this case came from British Columbia and didn't have any echo in our center. Usually patients that they are from our center uh, because we have a, a special clinic for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I think every, uh, every Thursday. And that is after the name of Dr. Weigel. It's called Dr. Weigel Clinic of Hypertrophic and Dr. Rakowski, my teacher, is running that one. Uh, but this patient came from British Columbia, so didn't have any echo here. That's the reason that we were in trouble in the OR. When we did the pre-op echo, we saw no SAM. We see some septal hypertrophy, but there's no SAM. And the valve has some restriction. Looks like this is a rheumatic valve. See, there is MR, it's posteriorly directed, but it's not after SAM. Or is mixing with the MR after SAM. Is the AI, anytime you saw two valves, three valves involved, usually they are rheumatic. Okay. So this is a mixing of the SAM MR and primary mitral valve disease MR. Valve is a little bit strong. Anyway, I I warned Dr. Tony that you you are doing my ectomy, but I don't think it will be any effective for MR. And patient will be the same symptomatic again. So. so yeah, he said, oh, I didn't know, I didn't tell Dr. David, so oh, I will do the myectomy, and hopefully we do the mitral sometimes later. Uh, so this is a post-stop, you see, AI is there, and you see the MR is there, so there's no difference for patient. So the result was not good because this patient was not assessed pre-op before coming to the OR very well. And, uh, and this patient was taken to this ICU after myectomy. In ICU, arrested the day after, I think, was resuscitated. What was discharged, but still the MR was there. So there's a couple of questions here at the end of the session. The question number one, based on American Heart Association classification, which of the following cardiomyopathy is a primary cardiomyopathy? A stress-induced is a primary. Cardiac amyloidosis is not primary. Endomyocardial fibrosis or Le Flair disease is not a primary. It's because of the hyper syndrome. 
and homochromocytosis is not primary. So number A is the answer. All of the following are complications of surgical myectomy, except VST is a complication. Also, we don't see it in our center. Complete block is a complication. Pulmonary regurgitation is not a complication because we are not opening the right side. So answer is C. Question number three, which of the following is correct? Mortality of the myectomy is 3%, 2% is not, is less than 1%. In group of patients with senior septum, chance of VST is higher, is not, at least in the hand of Tani. Chance of complete AV block is less than alcohol septal ablation, this is correct. Chance of residual severe SAM is 5%, no. Severe SAM, we don't see it usually. If you see severe SAM, you have to go back and fix it. So the answer is C. Which of the following treatment in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is less effective? Myectomy is effective. Alcohol is effective. Medication is effective. Pacemaker is not effective. So B is the answer. And number five question. Uh, all of the following statements about alcohol septal ablation in hypertrophic are correct except it is less invasive compared to the surgical myectomy. This is correct. Chance of AV block is 10%. This is correct. In elderly patient with comorbidity is a better choice. It is correct. Relief of gradient at the LVT is faster than surgical. No. In surgical, relief is fast. You see it in the OR. In alcohol, it takes six months to see a good reduction of the uh, LVT obstruction. So these are the answers. And I think we reached to the end. So as I said, you can use this lecture even for the people that they, they are going to leave the center after a couple of days or week. You can have it and you can be an ambassador of myectomy in your center. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.